And the day is coming to an end, but we're gonna go out with a bang. This is one of my favorite speaker ever. All her talks are just short of amazing, um, if not more than that. Um, let's all welcome uh, Caroline with us. Welcome, Caroline. Hi there. It's very wonderful to be here, and thank you for such a, a wonderful introduction. It's the minimum I can do. All <laughs> your talks are always mind blowing, eye opening, and uh, you just talk about the most epic topics ever. Um, something that I mean, we are here to make a dent in the world with our work, yeah. and. Uh, that's what we all aspire to uh, to do and if we can do it in a way that uh, is inclusive and uh, thoughtful and uh, makes a big impact in the world that's uh, even better right that's my job <laughs> yeah <laughs> so thank you for being with us today um i don't think i need to really introduce you because uh you are one of the most uh noteworthy people in our community uh, but i think that uh the topic you're talking about today is uh yes it's uh it has been debated quite uh quite for some time in the open source uh, software community but uh we haven't yet uh come to um to really have a way to um uh, you know get out of the debate and more into the action like what can yeah. we do right um point being open source is ubiquitous by uh by today it's like uh when 20 years ago uh, we started talking about it uh, we had no idea how far it could come and right now it's almost well basically it's everywhere it's not almost but it it is everywhere um and Unfortunately, this means that it's also in places where we as contributors wouldn't very much like it to be. Uh, so we're talking about seriously big stuff like uh, some of the things you have named uh, are uh, mass surveillance or uh, anti-immigrants policy and uh, weapon uh, um, production and, uh, and uh, sales. So. I assume that uh, most of us out there uh, are not particularly keen in seeing our work being used in uh, in those um, in those areas. Um, what can we do actively to uh, to change that? And that's why you're here today um, <laughs> for uh, to uh, with us to talk about this. You just the gave rising. half my talk, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a better orator than I. So. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Coraline Nate Amke and I'm a big time troublemaker. Um, in the early 2010s, I fought for uh, codes of conduct at tech conferences. Believe it or not, that was once incredibly controversial. I also am the creator of the Contributor Covenant, the first and most popular open source code of conduct. Um, the Ruby community honored me with the Ruby Hero Award in 2016. Um, a few years ago, I spoke at the United Nations Forum on Business and Human Rights. Um, I'm most recently the author of the Hippocratic License, which is an ethical open source license based on the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I'm also the founder of the Organization for Ethical Source. In the 1960s, amidst growing tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, a computer scientist published a short piece that he called The Parable of the Locksmith. And this is my retelling. One day, a mysterious stranger walked into a locksmith shop and he came with a proposition. He said, I have a job that needs doing and it requires someone with your highly specialized skills. I've done my research and you are one of the smartest and most capable locksmiths in the entire city. The locksmith was flattered and a little intrigued, and the man continued, I want to hire you to open a certain safe. Never mind whose safe it is, that's none of your concern. Just do the job I hire you to do, and I will make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. 
The locksmith was excited at the proposition of such a lucrative job, but he was also a bit nervous because what was that about not knowing who the safe belonged to? It seemed suspicious. And the stranger went on, there are other conditions you have to agree to. I'll blindfold you and take your phone before bringing you to the safe's location. And you can never tell anyone that I hired you. This struck the locksmith as very odd, but he thought about what the man had said about making him rich. He'd struggled all his life and never felt properly rewarded for the hard work that he put in. You can have all the tools you need to do the job, said the stranger, the very best tools. I will spare no expense. Take your time. I'll be back tomorrow for your answer. Despite his hesitation about the nature of the job, the locksmith spent all night thinking about his crummy apartment, his shabby furniture, his daughter's dream of one day going to college. From the beginning, his family had had to scrimp and save just to get by. And anyway, he thought to himself, if I don't take this job, he'll just go to another locksmith, the second best locksmith. The next day when the stranger returned, the locksmith agreed to take the job. After multiple blindfolded trips to and from this unknown location, the locksmith finally cracked the safe. He wasn't allowed to see what was inside. The stranger blindfolded him again as soon as the lock clicked open. But true to his word, the stranger made the locksmith exceedingly rich. We're going to come back to this parable and find out what happened when the safe was opened in just a few minutes. First, I need to tell you another story. This is an HP laser jet. It was one of the first laser printers on the market. It came out in 1983. At the time, a man named Richard Stallman, I know, was working in an AI lab at Xerox. And the lab had one of these printers. It was cutting edge. But the problem with the printer is that it always jammed. Now, the lab had time-sharing software for various resources, including the printer, um, and you had to set aside or schedule time for, to use it. And if you set aside 30 minutes for the printer and then it jammed three minutes in, of course, you'd be upset. So uh, Stallman and his coworkers decided to uh, update the printer driver so that it would report jams back to the time-sharing software and users could be notified. But he discovered that the software was proprietary and HP wouldn't share the source code. Stallman learned that a colleague at MIT had the source code, but that person had signed a non-disclosure agreement and couldn't share it. And Stallman got really angry, not just about the printer, but about the fact that he saw the world shifting toward proprietary software. And this incident would lead to the creation of the free software movement. And eventually the open source movement. In the mid to late 90s, when the world first discovered the internet, um, free and open source software was a, a popular choice for web servers. There was Apache, um, a very popular web, ser web server software. A lot of systems were based on a stack, on the LAMP stack with the Linux kernel at the base, Apache for web services, MySQL for data storage, and PHP or Perl for dynamic pages. And all of these were open source technologies. Christine Peterson coined the term open source in 1998. And that same year, the open source definition was pinned by Bruce Perrins. Nine months later, the open source initiative was founded to promote the use of open source software. And over the past 20 years, the open source community has really been thriving. We're enjoying wild success and we've permanently changed the technology landscape. But the world has also changed a lot in the past few decades. All over the globe, we're seeing technology being leveraged to commit human rights abuses on an alarming scale. And the technology powering these abuses includes free and open source software. Open source software today is playing a critical role in mass surveillance, anti-immigrant violence, protester suppression, racially biased policing, and the development of cruel and inhumane weapons. And open source complicity isn't a bug, it's a feature. This is by design. The open source definition allows for the use of software for any purpose, including explicitly for evil. And they say that giving everyone freedom means giving evil people freedom too. This makes no sense to me. Under what other circumstances in human society 
Do we grant complete freedom to evil people to do evil things? There's increasingly debate and discussion among open source developers about our ethical responsibilities as creators. The debates are heated and the media has been paying attention. The fundamental question seems to be, are we responsible for how the technologies we develop are used? And a lot of us are beginning to accept that our work in open source might be contributing to some pretty nasty things, some human rights violations, other atrocities in the US, around the world. We're horrified by what's happening and we're horrified at the thought that we may in some way be contributing to it. We feel powerless. We wanna find some way to do the right thing. The conversation around ethics and in, in technology is not new. It's been happening in our field since before there was even such thing as software. I wanna introduce you to a man named Edmund Berkeley. He was one of the most important pioneers of ethics and computer science in the 20th century, yet almost no one knows who he, who he was. He got to start working on computers with the Navy during World War II, actually working side by side with uh, Grace Hopper. He published the world's first computer magazine, and he was among the first people to, to propose the idea of a personal computer. Berkeley co-founded the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, at Columbia University in 1947. The organization's charter um, is to foster the open interchange of information and promote the highest professional and ethical standards. Berkeley sat on the Committee for the Social Responsibility of Computer Scientists, which published a, an historic report in 1958 on the ethical obligations of computer scientists. And the findings of the report boil down into four simple statements. First, that we cannot rightly ignore our social responsibilities. Secondly, that our social responsibilities can't be delegated to others. Third, that we cannot rightly neglect to think about how our special role can benefit or harm society. In other words, we must consider how our special capacities and capabilities can help to advance socially desirable applications and prevent undesirable outcomes. And finally, we cannot avoid deciding between conflicting responsibilities. We must think how to choose. The report went on to say, that when one reflects upon the great forces that we computer people are associated with, it is no longer difficult to grasp and perhaps accept our heavier than average share of responsibility. The committee believed that given the power and potential of computers, ethical considerations were paramount. And they concluded the scientist credo, knowledge for knowledge's sake, comes into conflict with our ethical responsibilities. Given human society in our century, and the ethical value system we are using in our century. We can label some classes of work as obviously socially desirable and other classes of work as obviously socially undesirable while acknowledging there's a large middle ground which cannot clearly be classified. It was Berkeley who wrote the parable of the locksmith. And remember it was the height of the cold war when he wrote it. Here's how the parable ends. A month later, the retired locksmith saw a news headline about the theft of top secret military schematics. And soon after that, the mysterious stranger himself appeared on the world stage, declaring himself master of all nations and backed by the overwhelming threat of a devastating stolen superweapon. So Berkeley went on to ask, did the locksmith do what was right? And he contended that the locksmith had a responsibility to determine if the stranger was a criminal before agreeing to work with him. So no, the locksmith did not do what was right. Berkeley said that the computer scientist does not have the right to shut their eyes in regard to their responsibilities any more than the locksmith has. And he called on his colleagues to shoulder their proper social responsibilities. And he was largely ignored. Fast forward about a decade, it's 1972. The Vietnam War is raging. Berkeley and his colleague Franz Alt 
were invited to address the Association of Computing Machinery at a special dinner honoring them as founders on the organization's 25th anniversary. Franz Alt's topic was reflections and Berkeley was to address the more feature looking topic of horizons. Alt's talk was celebratory and he provided a retrospective on all the advances in computer engineering and computer science since World War II. But Berkeley's speech took on a distinctly different tone. Berkeley told the audience that anyone who is working to further unethical uses of computers, including the use of computers in developing weapons technology, should quit their jobs. He called out members of the audience by name. Many of his colleagues were so upset by his comments, they stood up and walked out in the middle of a speech. And sad to say, Admiral Grace Hopper was among those who left. Berkeley concluded his speech by saying it was a gross neglect of responsibility that computer scientists were not considering their impact in terms of societal benefit or harm. Other scientists in this era were facing their own significant ethical dilemmas. World War I saw the first large-scale deployment of chemical weapons and the horrors of death by poison gas once they became public and repercussions throughout the chemical production world. Between the 1918 armistice and 1933, several international conferences were held to solve the problem of limiting or abolishing chemical weapons. And to this day, in the United States, no chemical manufacturer produces a solution that's used for death by lethal injection. It's against their ethical code. After seeing the inhumane devastation of the atomic bomb at the end of World War II, Scientists sought to limit or eliminate the bomb's threat to human civilization. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists became the voice for the ethical responsibilities of physicists. And the Doomsday Clock Project was launched and continues to this day as a reminder of the danger of doing nothing. Nazi Germany used technology and services provided by IBM in their efforts to identify and destroy the country's Jewish and Romani minorities. The Nazis even shipped IBM punch cards on the trains to concentration camps. And it's widely accepted that this makes IBM complicit in the Holocaust. And how did the computer science community deal with its ethical conflicts, the realization that they might be complicit in genocide and other atrocities? They got up and they left the room. And that shirking responsibility is pervasive in the open source world today, too. Technology companies routinely rely on open source software to provide services, for example, to ICE in the U.S. How would we feel about the complicity of IBM and the Holocaust if their punch card system had been released under the MIT license? Because that is exactly the situation we're facing now. In 1998, when the open source definition was penned, the greatest evil conceivable by technologists was the market domination of Microsoft with its operating system and that it's in an Explorer browser. The founding thinkers responsible for Floss clearly understood the impact of technology on society, but they didn't use an ethical framing for technology. They, they chose to focus on technology in intellectual property terms. And in, 2021, we face threats that are much larger than the market domination of a web browser. We're in an age where corporations and governments are carrying out programs of mass surveillance, suppressing legitimate political protests, and perpetrating state-sanctioned violence and even genocide. In the U.S., the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, has been separating children from their parents at our border for years and putting immigrants and asylum seekers in cages without reliable legal assistance or due process, let alone medical care. Right now, there are an estimated 40,000 people in ICE custody. And there have been so many hundreds of documented deaths in these concentration camps, most of them due to gross neglect. And US tech companies are collecting billions of dollars in contracts to support this program of terror. What does this have to do with open source? Let's take a well-known example. 
Palantir Technologies is a software company co-founded by a Trump advisor named Peter Thiel, and they collect millions of dollars from ICE every year. Palantir has over 200 projects hosted on GitHub, which in turn rely on thousands of other open source projects. Every dependency in use by ICE and Palantir contributes to human rights violations. Palantir is explicitly leveraging open source to aid in a bad human rights abuses, and it's not alone. In 1999, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan announced the United Nations Global Compact. It's a pact to encourage businesses worldwide to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies. It's the world's largest corporate responsibility initiative with 13,000 corporate participants and stakeholders in over 170 countries. The very first section of the compact deals with human rights. And it states that businesses should support and respect the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights and that businesses must make sure they are not complicit in human rights abuses. Complicity has two different definitions or contexts. The first is providing goods or services that a company knows will be used to carry out human rights abuses. But also the second is when a company benefits from human rights abuses, even if they didn't positively assist or cause them, if it wasn't direct. Many large tech companies have been profiting from human rights abuses for years. And every time I give this talk, and it's been, I've been giving this talk for like over a year now, I call for those who have the privilege and safety to do so, to accept their ethical responsibilities and either organize for change or quit their jobs. And this includes tech workers at Amazon, at Microsoft, at GitHub, at Salesforce, Cisco, and so many others. Technology companies like these are profiting from human rights abuses, and according to the UN definition, they're complicit. And they're using our software. Are we going to get up and leave the room again? Are we going to accept responsibility for how our work is being used? In 2014, the Ruby community came together and demonstrated its commitment to the values of diversity and inclusion by embracing Contributor Covenant. Today, I'm asking the Ruby community to once more take a stand. I don't expect you all to relicense your gems under an ethical license, but I do expect us to come together as a community and reflect on our shared values, how we can center them in everything we do, how we can accept our outsized responsibilities as technologists, how we can prevent our work from being used to cause harm. It's time for us to go beyond nice. Frankly, I'm, I'm sick of nice. Nice is meaningless if we're not just. Nice is meaningless if we're not equitable. We can't keep using nice as a shield that we hide behind, ignoring our impact. Because we face a much bigger challenge today than a threat of proprietary software. Stallman wanted a printer driver. We want to keep our work from being used by fascists. That's what this revolution is about. And it's my hope that just like we did seven years ago, the Ruby community will stand up and lead the way. I founded the Ethical Source Movement and now the Organization for Ethical Source to empower us as developers, as creators, as contributors to take responsibility for our impact, to find ways to promote justice and equity in our work, to ensure that our work is being used for social good, to prevent the harm caused by pretending that technology is neutral. And I hope you'll join us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Caroline. This was a, a great call to action for uh, for all of us. Um, thank you for being so passionate and speaking out loud uh, for all of us that very often don't think about all the implications of what we do. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, while we wait for uh, some questions to uh, to be there, um, I do have one for uh, from my side. Do you uh, do you have the feeling that ethics and uh, ethical uh, coding or software engineering, as we want to call it, uh, is uh, something that it's being talked beside the open source community um, in I don't know colleges how do you see in your experience is there something like that for example we're seeing a lot more of that um in fact over the over the past six months or so most of my new twitter followers have actually been from academia and a lot of the people that we have been um that have been joining the ethical source working group there are a lot of academics in there and a lot of great programs i uh i gave a i gave a uh, a lecture at the uh Colorado University Center for Democracy and Technology last year, uh, last um, January, February. Um, that talk is up, um, that workshop is up with a great discussion afterward. Um, just even tomorrow, I'm speaking at Carnegie Mellon University. They have a oh. program called Ethics and Policy and Computing that I'm doing a guest lecture at. Um, people like Nathan Schneider, who are doing amazing work in, uh, in governance and open source. Um, I work with them. Um, we have a lot of interest in academia. I think a lot of people are starting to see that uh, computer science as a, as a discipline isn't enough to prepare someone for their role in our industry and their responsibilities in our industry. We're seeing a lot more, at least in the US, a lot more programs that are combining social sciences with computer sciences um, to better understand the impact that technology has on society and to uh, hopefully produce better outcomes um, but better, uh, better outcomes for our communities. So I am seeing that and that is very heartening. And I really think that uh, a lot of the work that's coming out of programs like that um, are gonna be very influential. There's always a little bit of time between what happens in academia and how it affects our industry. Yes. But I'm very hopeful that uh, people are talking about this and people are working on this problem and people are, are coming up with solutions. Yeah, definitely. Um... If we were to uh, educate ourselves a little bit more, do you have any sources to recommend uh, other influential people like you to follow and to uh, to help? Well, we have uh, we have a lot of resources at ethicalsource.dev. Um, we provide quite a bit of background reading. Um, awesome. I've given multiple talks on on this topic. Um, this talk has evolved over the past year. Um, so we have recordings, we have podcasts. There's an ethics and open source podcast that we're doing with the Sustain OSS folks. Um, it's all on ethicalsource.dev, as well as the, uh, a form you can fill out if you're interested in joining us in this work. That's awesome. Uh, what what pushed you to uh, to launch this uh, this initiative, this movement? Well, um, it kind of connects with the work that I've been doing over the past 10 years. Um, I feel like uh, the, biggest, the biggest change that happened in, uh, in open source in the early 20 teens wasn't just that we started adopting codes of conduct, it's rather what they represent. For, uh, for so long, we were very focused on, uh, on who we were writing open source software for, hmm. corporations. Um, and we're very focused on making our work palatable to corporations because we wanted corporations to adopt our work. And what we saw um, 10 years ago now was people starting to stop and wonder, well, hey, what about the practice of what we're doing? What about the communities that are forming around these projects? Shouldn't we be, be paying attention to those as well? And that really started a shift in mindset, I think, um, where we started examining not just the outcome of open source, but the practice of open source, how we treat each other as we contribute, how, what yes. we design and for whom, and um, how we design to prevent bad outcomes, um, how we design for accessibility as a human right, how we design for privacy, um, protections. Um, this is all part of that process, I think, of a, a maturing of, of our communities 
um, to care more than just to care about more than just adoptions. I had the feeling that uh, I was thinking about what you just said about um, accessibility, uh, that it was something that was uh, spoken a lot during the uh, early 2000s, 1990s, but to, today is less present in people's mind when designing uh, uh, websites, just to name one, yeah. one thing. We, uh, we created the ethical source principles. Excuse me. We just, uh, we just, uh, went through a community project to, uh, to revise and update them. They're at ethical source.dev slash principles. And we call out accessibility as one of our seven ethical principles, uh, because we strongly believe that accessibility is a human right. And, uh, like you said, you're very right. And it's sad that, uh, we have uh, we have a whole field of specialization, and we so rarely listen to them. Um, we we're so quick to uh, to build web apps and apps, and we don't think about the people who are using them. We think we think of the people using them being just like us, and mm -hmm. we think if we design something as perfect for us that other people will love it. And we don't think about the people where that we're leaving behind. And another thing that I really want to point out that I feel so strongly about it's not just the people creating the software. And it's not just the people who are using the work that we've created. It's also the people that our software is used on. And often, mm -hmm. without their consent, they have to be at the forefront of our thinking as we decide what we're going to build and how. Because it's not just about users. It's about our impact on our communities, Absolutely. on our societies. Absolutely. Uh, I, this is something that is uh, worrying me a little bit because my team is going to start working on a more community oriented uh, part of our application. And what I'm noticing in the conversations is just because people are not used to think about how people can misuse the system. Yeah how risky it is for others that are not, you know, the uh, the usual users that people yeah. usually think about, right? Um, yeah. And it's a message that is really difficult to, to pass, not necessarily for uh, malice, but really for just ignorance in, in the yeah. purest form, like without any judgment. Uh, it's just, you know, you don't experience that, therefore you don't, you don't see it. Uh, you cannot perceive it. And that causes such harm and that puts so many people in harm's way. Absolutely. Especially when you are talking about, you know, uh, personal space. Uh, I remember ages ago having to discuss with a PM that uh, really didn't get why having a public profile was uh, dangerous when introducing uh, GPS tracking for our runs. And I'm like, <sighs> I'm very yeah. happy for you. You have never experienced anything dangerous about you. <laughs> <laughs> that was. <laughs> Let me tell you about my world. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Caroline, uh, first of all, I'm sorry because I butchered your name when I first introduced it's okay. you. <laughs> you didn't um, say Caroline, and that's the thing no. that I say. Really <laughs> <laughs> that, that I spared you. Um, thank you so much for being with us and always for being at the forefront and a light bearer for all of us uh, in uh, in this super hard uh, topics to uh, to confront because they are uh, they are part of uh, being human, uh, but they are also difficult things to face when you are one of the privileged. So yes. thank you again for your hard hard work. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. I really appreciate it. And Anytime. Uh, I miss the Ruby community so much. Over the past year, I feel so disconnected. So I'm so happy to be able to, to be here with everyone today. Well, we hope to uh, see you maybe also in person next year. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I wish you a great day. Um, and thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye. Oh.